team, welcome to 10 Talks. Well, it's a new season and this is a total 10 for me. I was really curious about what it takes for women to win. And I have been raised by a great family. My brother was a huge influence to me and really everything about what he taught me growing up to be an athlete was to be tough and to be strong and girls don't cry and you know, all that good stuff. And love him dearly to this day. He's still one of my all-time favorites and heroes. And then I started playing sports and I was coached by men. And then I went into the business of sport and that was all men. And I learned pretty much everything I know from a business perspective from men. And I'm very blessed. Thank you, God. I've had a good life. I really appreciate everything I've been given. I've been given three daughters, raising three daughters. And all of a sudden at this stage in my life, I was just really curious about how do women win versus how do women win the men's way? And so I just started asking that question, how do women win our way? And I have no idea because I haven't done it a woman's way. I've really adapted myself into a male model and I'm very grateful for the amazing guys that have helped me to become the success I am. And so I'm coming at this season strictly with an open heart and an open mind and very curious. So I started sharing with my team of people just my desire to figure out how do women win and what is our way. And through the power of team, one of my coaches said, well, you've got to meet Kathy. She wrote this incredible book and it's called Gender and Competition, How Men and Women Approach Work and Play Differently. I didn't know Kathy, I never read the book, but again, through the power of team and just connecting through that purpose and passion, I had another friend who knew Kathy and said, of course, I'll connect with you. So Kathy and I had one phone call. I shared with her really what my mission was. And I said, will you please team up with me? So team, that's what your journey, what you're on the journey with us to do. Kathy and I are starting a journey together. We're committed to writing a book. The book is called How Women Win Our Way. And we want to know from you. We want to hear from you. We want to talk to women about really how they're winning their way. And we're going to start the conversation. So Kathy, thank you so much, first of all, for agreeing to even do this with me. I know you and I, we've never met. We don't know each other. We've had a few email exchanges, a few conversations just to make sure we were on mission together. And I'm incredibly grateful for you, for the work you've done and the book you've written. And I'm so blessed and honored to share that with our listeners and most importantly, to continue your journey. You wrote the book in 2004 and you've still very much been in the game discovering more and more. And I wanna hear where we are from 2004 to where we are today and just start that journey. So welcome, thank you very much. And tell us about a bit about your story. Yeah, Carlette, it's a, uh, mine's a long story, but I'll shorten it uh, for the purposes. It's a long story because I am now in my 60s and I uh, was growing up in the 1960s uh, and I was a tomboy uh, and had um, kind and loving parents who even when they were fairly worried uh, about how I was going to turn out, let me be me. Yeah. And so I loved sport. I loved competition. I'm 14 months behind my older sister who was better at all of the stuff that girls do. She was prettier. She could color inside the lines. Uh, she looked nicer in her clothing. Uh, and I was none of those. I was the urchin uh, who <laughs> liked to run and play and tumble. And I was very competitive. And so the only way to compete with somebody who's better at you than everybody, everything else is to go in a different direction. Uh, so tennis racket, uh, got that early on, chemistry set, those kinds of things. And then every sport um, that was available. Um, so... Yes, in 1973, I graduated from high school and so went to a parochial school where there were girl sports, by the way, from the time I was in seventh grade. So I had a head start on a lot of my peers, um, but played all the sports, um, softball, volleyball, basketball, soccer. Uh, there were only, I, 
I say now that there were only about 25 girls in the school that wanted anything to do with sports. And so whatever sports you offered, we played uh, because we weren't competing with anybody for positions on the team. Um, then went to went to college uh, and played sports there. I uh, was in, in college from uh, 73 to 78. Uh, at the end of it, there were some there was some scholarship money at Michigan State, um, just you know maybe a quarter's worth, but some money was being put in to, to girls and women's sports. Um, I I was a candidate my senior year for the Wade Trophy uh, in women's basketball. I didn't win it, but I was a candidate for it, and I think that got the attention of a group of folks who were trying to start a women's basketball league, and that's what it was called, Women's Basketball League, WBL, long ago precursor uh, to, to the WNBA. I played for two years, wanted to go to law school, had no money because Back then, there really was no money in women's professional sport, so needed a job. And at that point in time, a, all you needed to get a job coaching in college, if you were female, was the fact that you had played. Hmm. Okay. And so okay. I became a head coach at 24 wow. at Ferris wow. State, did well enough there after four years uh, to get the job at the University of Kentucky, coached there until 93. And then I thought I wanted to be a major college athletics director. And I had a boss who was going to help me do that. So time out, Kathy, real quick. Which sport were you coaching? Because you played all uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good, good call. Yeah, finished playing basketball, but got a volleyball coaching job okay. because I had played on the junior national team and um, had, had uh, been a successful volleyball player. Right. So, yeah, went the route of coaching in volleyball at Kentucky also. Um, that went into a fundraising role, AD who said, all right, you want to be a AD, you need, how, you, know, you need to know how to raise money and you need to, to know how to manage and work with power coaches. And so I'll give you the opportunity to learn those skills. And he did. I did that for 10 years. And it was during that time, I've always been fascinated by issues of gender. And, and it was really during that 10 years that I started seeing as more and more male coaches were coaching women's volleyball, were coaching women's basketball, soccer, but then also being around a lot more male programs and their practices than I had ever seen, um, started to see patterns. And so the book with the academic title of Gender and Competition is not really an academic book. The research is what I call field research. It's my observations and then lots and lots of reading of Carol Gilligan's stuff, Deborah Tannen's stuff on the sociology of gender and the issues around gender. So, um, yeah, I've been at the AVCA now, the American Volleyball Coaches Association, as the executive director for 15 years. Um, and, you know, have continued to, to be interested uh, in these topics. So, when you reached out and said, Are you ready to write another book? My immediate answer was no, uh, because the first one was so hard. And then you really talked me into it um, because you told me you would help me. So um, <laughs> I'm excited about this project. Uh, I think it's the next step on this. Um, in my book, I looked at the why mm -hmm. and the what mm -hmm. uh, of gender differences in competitive settings. But I don't think that I explored in great depth how women lead. Since then, you and I have both seen just incredible women in leadership roles, very successful coaches, very successful women in business. And so like you, I don't have all the answers to the how, but I'm fascinating in, in, in this journey to find them out with you. Well, and team, that's what journey you're on with Kathy and I is that we are just totally committed to figuring this out. I mean, that's the joy of this journey is that we don't have the answers. Kathy did a beautiful job and team, I highly recommend you listening and or reading her book in terms of really what it's all about. You'll be able to see that on our copy, but what's important about gender and competition and just while we're different 
is Kathy and I are really curious about that competitive spirit. I mean, that's the world that we live in is that we have been athletes, we've stayed in the world of sports and really how do we as women be able to honor our competitive spirit and honor us being women? And that's a part that I don't know the answer to because I haven't done it that way. I've very much done it according to kind of being what I'm supposed to be. And so when I thought about raising my three little women, I was like, time out. You know, I'd like to try to figure something different out. And it's definitely a huge purpose and mission for me because writing a book to me is like childbirth. I mean, it's like having another kid. So when I even said to myself, do I want to write another book? I thought I was crazy because I'm like, you know, this is like having a child. And I swore after I finished my first book, I would never do that again. And, you know, usually when you write a book, the editors and different people or publishers are like, okay, your next book is due in a year. And it's like, there's no way. I mean, you know, talk to me, maybe I don't even know when. And so this was a total shock to me. So when Kathy says, you know, she's her first response was no, my first response was no for a long time too. So just shows you how passionate we are and here we go. So let's dive into the conversation. So Kathy, what I'm really curious about that you and I have started to explore is just how do we empower women to be strong, to be competitive and really to be for each other. I think that's the part that we're struggling with is because we're new in our power or new in our roles is that sometimes we can come about it in a way that it can appear that we're not for other women or we're not helping other women. And, and from your book, you talk so much about how everything from a woman's perspective is about, you know, being liked and being included and, and that community. So it feels like we're really torn when we go for winning or leading or being competitive versus really our DNA, that really that desire to be liked and part of something. How have you found in your book and just now through all of your experience that we can start to bring those, those components together? Well, it's interesting, uh, Carlette. I think we're at the right place at the right time. Uh, is the world has changed very dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years. And whereas all businesses and organizations were very hierarchical in structure. Knowledge was power and at the top you hoarded it, you kept the budget in your pocket and you didn't share it with anybody. Now you could control all the money. Um, the sales reports and everything else, you had those in another pocket and you could control all that. Well, two things have happened. One is technology, um, which and I've been in plenty of organizations where we actually said as only a partial joke line that we all work for tech <laughs> um, but, uh, because they can shut us down so quickly when our equipment doesn't work and when our, <laughs> when we, uh, yeah, when, when the spreadsheets aren't loading properly or those kinds of things, but it's now almost impossible in organizations to hoard information. And that very fact of that has broken down hierarchical structures in organizations. The second thing that has changed is the world has gone global. And we have found that other cultures um, manage differently than we do. And if we want to be successful working cross-culturally, we need to adapt how we're doing things to a much more relational style. Mm -hmm. I have to have a talk with myself each time before I'm going to speak with my Japanese counterparts, um, with my very good friends from China, um, to lower my transactional bend. Hi, how are you? How's everything going? Listen, I was thinking about this idea and stuff. What do you think about if we partnered on this? It's like, no, 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 no. That's not how it's done. It's how are you? How is your family? And again, not right or wrong, just different. Yeah. But I think it's given us um, the ability to see that we can adapt. And so now we're living in a time where if you look from 2000 to 2020, 
and you look at women in management and you look at the preferences of employees for working for women leaders, the, the percentages just continue to go up of people say, boy, I would like to work for, uh, yeah, no, I prefer a women manager. Why? Well, they're more collaborative. Um, you know, it feels like more of a team. Uh, they're more empathic about what things might be happening in my life, or if I make a mistake. Um, and so, yeah, so we're in a place right now where our leadership skills are more valued in the workplace than they were 40 years ago. Um, and so I think, I think that's something that we can also lean into. Mm. Now, what's interesting, Kathy, in our book is we want to talk to professional athletes, to college athletes, to college coaches, professional coaches, to athletes who have transi transitioned into business. You know, we're really looking for how did we do this? And so we're really curious from everybody's perspective. So you've talked about business and you've talked about that ability to collaborate and to lead. Let's just step into the college athlete perspective and say, OK, well, what a gift. I mean, I know that was one thing when I came to you, I said, I really am compat. I'm really passionate about making sure that we train these girls how to be great leaders. And it's interesting because we have college girls that are um, in sports and they also have either male or female coaches. And we're starting to watch how does that interaction work? Is it for success? Is it working? What's the difference? I know in 2004, when you wrote your book, you did some research, field research, figured this out. You had experience on it. Tell us about the difference between how female athletes respond to male and female coaches. Yeah, it, um, it's really at the heart of what we're trying to explore is women who are very, very successful coaches of women's teams, and there are bunches of yeah. them. Yeah. What are they doing that is filling the needs for leadership, for management, for making me better, and for affiliation and relationship of their, of their female athletes? And just having a good time, right? I mean, in terms of me enjoying the fact that I'm playing a sport in college rather than being all about anxiety or all about stress. I mean, we've lost a lot of joy. And as women, we thrive on that. So bringing it, bringing it back or forward, I don't know what the language is, but again, just figuring out how do we get all these components included? Yeah, yeah. Without going in the direction, I mean, I think sometimes when we talk about fun, we go, hey. You know, look, you're on a full ride. You got full cost of attendance. You know, this university spending a million and a half on your program and everything else. You're not here to have fun. You know, you're here to win matches. Uh, <laughs> and and yet for athletes, for most athletes, male or female and stuff, it, it, it is they are there to have a positive and fulfilling experience. So it's so. When we say it has to be fun and rewarding, we don't mean a namby-pamby right. um, kind of a uh, don't worry if you, oh, right. oh, don't, oh, you shanked the third serve into the stands. Oh, isn't that sweet? Wasn't that funny? It's like, no, it's none of that. But it still has to be something that feeds your soul as a human being enough of the time <laughs> um, that it's worth staying in the grind. Yeah, doing the work. I mean, pushing through the wins and the losses. And I think that comes back to that competitive spirit. I mean, for me as a competitor, winning is fun. You know, So it's like losing is not fun. So I don't care how much joy I'm having with my teammates or anything else. If I'm losing, that does not go well for me. I mean, I am not one that can kind of take it lightly. I will think about it. I will process it. I will come back stronger. That's not true of everybody. So when we get on these college teams, everyone there is a competitor in their own way. We all know we have different personalities, yet a college coach has got to really manage all of those personalities and manage their competitive spirit and their job of winning, which is a results-based job. And so 
how do we do this based on what are just some winning strategies or some keys that you found that we can really learn about how to honor our different personalities? Well, I think that's a real key, uh, Carlette. I, I think, uh, and it was something that when I went right from a competitive athlete into the chair of a coach, I had no clue about is that there, you know, we all normalize who we are. So whether it's our group uh, from a socioeconomic standpoint, uh, whether it's our race, um, whether it's our gender, we think we're normal and that other, others are others. And it's like, oh, weird. Oh, quiet. Oh, um, strange. Oh, hostile. Oh, angry. You know, um, so so we tend to normalize the way that we approach the world. And I know you and I both, have, you know, look at different um, templates that have been developed and have gone through the academic rigorous process to say, yes, these work. Um, whether it's the the insights that from that come from DISC, uh, from uh, from the DISC, whether it's Myers Briggs, or whether it's uh, Strength Finders, there's just bunches of tools out there. But that part of learning to be a successful coach is to recognize that there are different styles of how people learn and affiliate, how they take in information. Yeah, how they respond to pressure, to competition, to tone of voice. Exactly, exactly. To, hey, some kids love to be challenged. And so getting in their face with challenge and, and, and um, sometimes even shaming or humiliating is, you know, that you're just not good enough is well, they're going to prove it. Right. Other, other athletes, that type of rhetoric they will crater. I mean, they will agree with you. <laughs> you're yeah. not any good. I know I'm not any good. Yeah. Like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're supposed <laughs> to fight me on that comment, okay? And say, yes, I am. And it's like, no, I'm not. I'm terrible. Uh, you know, so- You found me out. Imposter syndrome, right? And I, yeah, it's like, yeah. you just validated now exactly how I feel. Confidence gap. You know, when is somebody struggling with confidence? And then how do you coach them when they're struggling with their confidence? Um, when does somebody need to be challenged and have a kick in the pants uh, because what they're contributing is not sufficient? How do you motivate them to do that? Again, with some kids, some girls, it's going to be challenging their competitive spirit. With other girls, it's going to be challenging them to do their part as a member of a group and that their crucial role they are not fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And so, so now they're letting down. It's like, hey, I know you're tired today, or I know you had a test yesterday, or you know, whatever and stuff, but are you really gonna let us all down? Yeah, like we so, need you. We need yeah, you. Yeah, a little bit more of a guilt-based plea, if you will, rather than a challenge-based. And so helping having coaches realize two things. One is how they learn is not the only way to learn and how is it different and then two the ability to recognize those different styles and then maybe three the self-awareness the emotional intelligence whatever you want to call it to say hey i'm here to bring out the best in you and so how i do it right now or what works for me doesn't matter because it's not working for you <laughs> and what can i you know, how will I change so that you can succeed? So, Kathy, when we're figuring all this out on these recruiting trips, right, because we do incredible amount of recruiting and making sure that the athlete really fits into our culture. And there's so much that goes into recruiting. What have you found about how we grow up that affects how we show up then in competition? Anything to do with I mean, like moms or dads or how we're treated? Because what's interesting is we act as if the athlete leaves all that at home, but yet they bring every bit of that, right? I mean, and, and actually in a bigger way because it's their first time to be completely on their own. So maybe what mom and dad were doing worked really well as long as mom and dad were doing it. And the minute they get on their own, they may be like, finally, you know, I'm going to forget everything and I'm going to try. I mean, you know, they may go completely a different direction. And 
we're caught right in the middle, coaching them into something to be their very best through a time that's transformational from a change management, I mean, academics, fitting in. The other thing that's really interesting about coming to college is any athlete that's on a college team, they were a superstar where they came from or they wouldn't be on the college team. And they've probably been a superstar since they were about eight or nine years old. They played varsity the whole time. They've started the whole time. Now they walk onto a team of everybody being just like them and they haven't had that kind of competition. So that's it. So they're away from home. We're managing family, um, just value systems and kind of where we come from. And then we're being challenged in a way we've never, we don't remember if you were eight or nine when you kind of got discovered or started figuring this out. There's so much new that's happening. How do we manage that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's really worthwhile for coaches. And I think the good ones do this. They spend a lot of time examining the, the situation around the athlete. What is the family of origin like? Is it a family that where, where the father is very, very dominant? Um, is, it the, is it a family where the mother is a professional person? Is it a single parent family um, where the leadership has come from just one gender? Um, you know, is it a family where um, the culture of origin is much more comfortable with raised voices and fighting verbal, um, you know, you know, move it and, you know, mom and dad raise their voice. I mean, I had an athlete after her first preseason as a freshman um, say, say, <laughs> say, I haven't been yelled at this much in my entire life as I have been in the last two weeks. And there was another woman um, grew up pretty hard scrabble uh, place, black woman from Chicago who grew up in the projects and stuff who laughed just hysterically at that and she said oh my lord I haven't been yelled at this little uh, in the last two weeks and stuff you know and so again neither one right or wrong they were both very successful volleyball players both became all SEC performers but they had grown up in very very different situations from a what does it mean when somebody raises their voice um what does it mean um, when someone is very cross, uh, what does it mean when somebody uh, is is very demanding as opposed to more nurturing? And so, what? Yeah, yeah. What's happening? And good coaches or good leaders, actually, managers the same way, are going to try and sense out what are the things you're getting here in terms of what somebody's comfortable with. Also, and I think this is one of the things, Carlette, that that we're examining as in youth sports particularly, and also now more, more regularly in high school sports, men are doing most of the coaching. Many of these are volunteer jobs or they're low pay jobs. Um, and a lot of times it's guys uh, that are taking these jobs and that are, are, are willing to be away from their own families or willing to give of their free time uh, to, um, you know, to coach teams. And so you may have somebody that comes into a women's team with a female coach that has never had a female coach. And so what does that mean in terms of their relationship um, and what are their expectations? I mean, one of the things that I've found um, uh, was very true when I looked at and talk to people about coaches is that gender behavior is very closely guarded, and this is counterintuitive, by the people in the gender. In other words, women do not let other women act like men. Mm. And men don't let other men act like women. <laughs> For very long. I mean, we'll take it every now and then, but yeah. then it's like, uh, you know, um, and so so these are things also that you have women coaches potentially who've never never played for a, a male coach and then maybe become an assistant with a head coach that's a guy. Right. It would never occur to either one of them that for her to be successful as a head coach, as a leader of women, she's going to have to do it differently than he did it. 
She yeah. can't just take what he did and take that into the gym and think it's going to work. It's not going to work because her women have other expectations. And I hope these are the types of things that we can explore with the people that are going to help us figure out this mousetrap. <laughs> yeah. So team, Kathy and I pass the challenge to you, right? Join our team, figure this out. You can see and hear how passionate we are about figuring it out. And to be continued, we're going to do this weekly. We're going to bring on some amazing guests that have agreed to be part of this journey with us. We want to hear from you. We've developed 10 questions that we're very curious about. That's the outline of our book. We're just going to really dive in and figure that out. If you'd like to be a part of it, if you'd like to hear our questions, you want to connect with us, you have some answers to this, you know how to do it, you're doing it, please go to how to uh, howwomenwin.com. Go to howwomenwin.com and connect with us and we're going to figure this out. So thank you for joining us today, Kathy. Thank you for being on this journey. You and I are right here week after week after week figuring it out. So team, go out and be a champion for you. Start to be aware of really what does it take for you to win and let's capture the how-to. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome.